All right, let's get seated uh, and let's get started, please. Let me just... Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you had a good weekend and are feeling refreshed to start second week of this semester. Um, I will set up the uh, auto grader on grade scope, so now you can try uh, your uh, first uh, homework. Sorry for a little delay. Uh, there were some silly bugs, as they always are, uh, and took me a moment to debug them. Um, just a heads up that for uh, only the Q1 in the instructions, you have to reach certain level of accuracy. And depending on what the, what the accuracy that you achieve is, we are detecting some points. However, for Q2 and Q3, the instructions are try the other feature representation or an implement bigram uh, feature extractor. For bigram, you have to implement it yourself. For better feature extraction, you can try whatever you want, including uh, trying out different libraries. Uh, we will, unless your code crashes, unless we get an error from your code, give you, uh, auto grader will give you maximum points for Q2 and Q3. But have in mind that we will manually review what you have implemented. So there might be some deduction of points if your, let's say, bigram implementation didn't crash, but it's completely wrong. Maybe that's something else that we didn't ask. So uh, ju just have that in mind that the points you get from the auto grader might be adjusted. And um, one request from me would be that in your better feature extractor, in comments, just try like just just describe what you are implementing, such that we need, when we start manually analyzing your code, we kind of have, are in a mindset of knowing what we are, uh, what you try to implement. Um, also, if you try other things, uh, things we we ask you to report only the best uh, better feature extractor, uh, which is not a combination of Unigram and Bigram features, uh, to. Um, um, we report. We ask you to report only the best, but you, maybe you have tried many things, and if you want, you can uh, let us know in the comments uh, as well. Uh, and instructions say we will take for the Q1 uh, whatever is the maximum accuracy you get from either Unigram or Better Extractor uh, for your features. So your Better Extractor of feature does not need to be better than Unigram. Okay, we just want to see you exploring over here. Um, are there any questions about this? Yes, please. Is there any specific accuracy you want for question number two? No, there isn't. Yeah. Uh, I would uh, keep in mind, uh, you know, we will check your implementation. So, for example, if you reach 70 something with unigrams and just 50 with bigrams, I would say your implementation is likely. Uh, buggy for bigrams. Although, you know, these net, these models are weird and anything can happen. So I would check, still check your accuracy just to be sure your implementation is right. Yeah. So for the better feature tracks, does it need to be unigram or bigram? Like, does it have to be like a bigram with some other stuff? No, it needs to be exactly opposite. So no, no unigram, no bigram, and no combination, just a combination of unigram and bigrams. That's what the, the assignment says. Okay. I think I'm a little confused. So we wouldn't want to split uh, each board individually because that'd be like a unigram, but say we remove stop orders. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um. Yeah, I, I kind of stripped a lot of things I wanted to say. Yeah, it's okay if you are trying different pre-processing steps, but keep the, you still use unigram uh, representation. Yeah, so as long as you are trying um, something with the pre-processing then then that's still uh, fine yeah yeah yes okay. that's that's okay yeah yeah sorry uh, i wasn't clear yeah that's that's right okay um so as this assignment is due in about i would say 10-ish days um Again, if you haven't taken machine learning before or deep learning, I recommend starting to work on this uh, immediately. Everything you have, you have learned uh, in the, almost everything uh, you have in the last lecture. And on that topic, just let's just revisit what we learned last time. Uh, we have, I have given you kind of like a crash course on uh, supervised machine learning as applied to binary text classification. 
And we have said that there are these four components of a supervised machine learning uh, system for this application. First one was a feature representation of the input, where we have seen that we first tokenize text, where basically we use white space tokenizer, meaning we split our string in the list of words. And then we map this list of tokens, which are words, into high dimensional feature vector, for example, uh, a vector of dimension of the size of the vocabulary, where we counted whether a word, a token in a vocabulary was present or not in a given text. Once we have that, we have uh, defined a classification function that decides which class to apply to an instance, positive or negative. And uh, I, I've been asked a great question. I have uh, also enforced that we have probabilistic uh, notion uh, inside this classifier. This was not strictly necessary, but I wanted you to see this uh, probabilistic uh, version of this classifier. And also the specific classifier we have introduced, logistic regression, will be a building block to neural networks. So we kind of you know, um, use the opportunity to both see a binary classifier and then to have a stepping stone for neural networks, which come, I believe, this Wednesday. Um, all right, so we have a function that tells us uh, that the probability of a given uh, list of token representing a given string, such as a movie review, will be positive. Uh, how, how do we find parameters of that model? Um, that model was defined by sigmoid, but sigmoid took as an input the dot product between a feature vector and a weight vector. And we didn't really know what those weight vectors are. And then we learned, okay, we need to find them um, through optimization. And for that, we first need to define a function we are gonna optimize. We said we are going to optimize minimizing negative log likelihood of our label data. And once we have defined that, then we said, okay, we don't have closed force solution for this uh, optimization problem. Instead, we are going to use um, a method for um, uh, a numerical analysis, which um, finds the minimum uh, of a function iteratively by starting with some random point and then moving in the direction of a steep descent, which we know from calculus is given by derivative or a gradient in high dimensional spaces. And by utilizing that property, we have iteratively came down to the uh, bottom of our loss function. So this is what we covered last time, quite a lot, right? Um, and we have also mentioned that there are two phases of a supervised machine learning. There is a training phase where we use a set of label training examples uh, where uh, we can then uh, find, okay, what's the uh, negative log likelihood? We can calculate it. And then uh, we can make uh, change our weights using the gradient descent update such that the uh, negative log likelihood lowers. And then uh, we didn't really talk about this much yet, but after we are done with training, there is a testing phase where our goal, the goal of machine learning is to be able to predict um, what's gonna happen with unseen instances. That's the whole point why we are doing this. Um, so here we use the held out test set uh, or development set in your uh, homeworks and you measure the model accuracy, for example. But I didn't really define what the accuracy of F1 score are. So we are gonna go quickly over that. Before I define accuracy and F1 score, now that I kind of uh, give you a little recap of what we talked about last Wednesday, are there any questions uh, about any of that? Yes, please. How this class uh, relates to information retrieval. So information retrieval is the uh, field that is, um, um, fo that focuses on finding information. Very often that takes a, a form of given a collection of text, I'm interested to find a document uh, that contains that text. Um, or contains or is relevant to that text. For example, our favorite search engines operate uh, like that. Um, information retrieval has uh, lots of intersections with NLP because you need good representations of the text and relevant documents to then be able to measure things like similarity between them. 
Uh, however, there are certain techniques in information retrieval that are not really at the heart of uh, NLP. So they intersect quite a lot. Uh, but my question was about things we have talked about last week, um, these components of supervised machine learning system. Again, silence for me means everything is like crystal clear. Yes? Uh, so are you asking how to implement things into the Python? Yeah. Yeah, so prerequisite for this course is Python. I expect you know Python. We are not covering how to implement things in Python. Um, so I I expect that you, given the concepts I described, you are able to uh, implement them in Python. The only thing I won't assume, uh, like I did in spring this year, is that you will uh, quickly catch up with PyTorch without any of my guidance. So there will be a session on PyTorch, which is a library for neural networks specifically. So for example, when we call backpropagation, which is an algorithm for changing weights in neural networks, these things we are gonna cover uh, in the lectures. But otherwise, my expectation is that you know how to implement things in Python. Yeah, and uh, there are different ways how you can go about implementing logistic regression. Uh, for example, uh, I keep talking about feature vectors and um, especially as we move forward with the course, you will work with vectors. But if you decide, I'm not gonna keep this, um, uh, instead of keeping my weights in a vector, I'm gonna keep them in a dictionary with my keys being the features like uh, words and uh, the values being the corresponding weight, that's gonna work out too. So there are different options of how you can go about implementing your first uh, assignment. Yes. Uh, or aggregate features from uh, we did not talk about word embeddings yet so I don't I don't want to go ahead of the yeah, course I think it's, it, uh, um, even here, when we did logistic regression, our features were, for example, in unigram representations, they were words. And each word was then associated with a weight uh, in our weight vector. So even here, we had started with the, um, you know, each word having a feature, each feature being a word having a weight associated with it. Um, we will see different representations um, and what we are doing in NLP today is not the logistic regression you have seen uh, last week. Uh, this was just uh, the simplest model with the simplest feature representation to kind of get into this topic. But basically what we kind of learn at the end of the first part of this semester, which are pre-trained language models, that's gonna be a baseline for most of the things. Uh, in NLP, unless your data is extremely scarce and you work with a really low research language, but maybe the simpler approaches would be better, yeah. Okay, so uh, accuracy and F1. Um, accuracy is basically the proportion of your uh, so-called true results among all of your results. Um, in other words, if you have, for each example, we have in our held out test set, we have a label, zero or one, positive or negative. And here you can just check, okay, how many times my model's predictions matches the prediction of the uh, human for this uh, instance. Um, I'm introducing this language with true positives, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives, which is, uh, if you haven't taken machine learning, it's one of these things that you will see uh, used frequently. And it's very simple. A true positive means that your instance is labeled by human as a positive instance, and your model predicts it's a positive, therefore it's true positive. However, it can happen that the um, model predicts it's a positive instance, and it's actually labeled as a negative instance, and that's a false positive. 
another, you can uh, make the same analogy with true negatives and false uh, negatives. Accuracy is fine if you have balanced distribution, meaning you have equal amount of positive and negative instances in your uh, test data, or when your cost of doing uh, making a false positive or false negative are roughly the same. And this is not the case in many applications. For example, um, in application uh, in medicine, if someone has to be, let's say, admitted to a hospital because based on whatever is written in a clinical note, false negative is a big problem, then, right? You have said that someone should not be, uh, you know, um, uh, recommended to stay in a hospital when in reality they should have. And that's a big concern. So for some applications, you care about uh, making less false negative more than uh, in the other. If you're, for example, um, you're doing a task where efficiency is very important and you don't want to have false negatives and the risk is not super high, which is, for example, the case with those retrieval tasks we mentioned before, then you, you uh, want to minimize false negative exactly opposite from application in medicine. And this is why uh, very often we have uh, F1 score reported uh, along the side accuracy. F1 score is a harmonic mean of uh, two, uh, two quantities, precision and recall. Precision tells us uh, amongst all the true positive prediction, amongst all uh, positive predictions we have made, among all instances we have labeled to be members of a positive class with our model, how many of them are actually positive? And uh, for example, again, in a medical uh, domain, that would mean how, how reliable is your test when you predict that there is that someone has a disease, for example. So here we care about precision. On the other side, recall measures the proportion of true positives that we identify. So among all instances that are labeled as positives uh, by humans in our data, how many did we actually label as uh, positives? And to make a similar analogy, if you had a pool of patients who have a certain disease, how many of them have you actually diagnosed as having uh, a disease? Or uh, other way around, how many patients go undiagnosed and untreated? So you want to have both high precision and high recall. And this is exactly what F1 score does by combining these two measurements. Um, Sometimes you'll see people reporting micro and micro and macro F1. These two words are so hard for me to pronounce that they sound uh, different. M micro F1, um, here you are basically going to, you make all your predictions and then you find all positives uh, in this data and uh, check which for which ones you made a positive prediction and you aggregate as you're basically working with one uh, data file. And the issue with micro F1 is that if you have certain classes that dominate your uh, your uh, data set, some classes have way more instances than other, then uh, whatever is F1 score that you achieve on those instances will over dominate the average measurement. So if your F1 is really good for a class that's highly represented in your test data, for example, you might have way more examples of people who do not have a certain uh, disease than uh, people that do. And then you report micro F1, it can suffer uh, from, uh, you know, suggesting that everything works better than it is. On the other hand, macro F1, you calculate for each class, positive, negative, uh, F1 score independently, and then you average them. And in this way, if you had really high uh, F1 score for one class and not really a good F1 score for the other class, the average F1 score will be lower. So yeah, you will also see people reporting these two uh, thing, things, uh, two F1 scores uh, separately. I think if they do not specify, is it macro or micro, uh, then um, most likely is a uh, uh, micro F1 score. But it's always good to check everyone's implementation because, um, yeah, documentations are pretty bad all around. Okay, those are accuracy and F1 score. In your homework, you are chasing accuracy. We'll be also printing uh, F1 score. So um, 
you can see what's going uh, on with these uh, two measurements. Yes. So you said that the plus four is a better metric. Than There's like an uneven amount of mm -hmm. positive and negative. Is F1 score still good if the even amount? Like if it was evenly. If it's distributed. evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. I wonder, I feel this is just uh, my feeling right now. Uh, I, would, I would need to uh, work the equations out, but I think you will get similar information from accuracy and F1. They, might, they will not be exactly the same because they are actually different equations, but I don't think you will get notably different rankings of models with respect to these two measurements then. Yeah, or like huge accuracy and very low F1 score, which you might get if the data is unbalanced. Uh, yeah, from my experience, yeah. Okay, so with that, we have covered everything I wanted to say uh, last week, and now we are moving uh, forward with uh, uh, another topic. And that other topic is going to be tokenizing uh, text. We are today just going to talk more about how to tokenize text. Reminder, I have told you that Tokenization is a process of splitting a string into a sequence of tokens. And tokens are defined already in 1992 as basic units which not need to be decomposed in a subsequent processing, which is pretty weight. I think when I ask you, we have talked about characters, words, uh, something in between, even bytes, why not, right? Uh, so what, what exactly is a token we didn't really define? Uh, for the purposes of the last lecture, I did introduce white space tokenizer, uh, where we just split by white space and uh, we end up with a list of more or less words. Uh, I said more or less because we don't handle uh, punctuation with um, really well if it's if it's uh, just literally splitting by white space. So here, story and period ended up being a single token, which is not what we want. They are separate linguistic units. And i have also giving you examples of how, how uh, else uh, a white space tokenizer is failing. So I told you like white space tokenizer doesn't really work. And I also hinted at least once that Tokenizers seem to be the this you know like just biggest issue in LLM world and certainly bring the uh, A game in memes uh, in in AI. So how come how come that still you know even on August twenty first of this year this is still uh, an issue? I will give you a few example of how tokenizers can fail or how the, how their failures cripple into downstream applications. So BERT, that's one of these language models released in 2018 that was the first big model that had started this LLM revolution that we will uh, talk about a bit before the uh, fall break. Um, so BERT had uh, determined that this uh, sentence, which uh, included the word super bizarre, is positive because the tokenizer had split the super bizarre into superb ISA RRE. So because superb is such a you know highly positive word, the whole classifier determined that this is sentence is positive, although this um, uh, word very common and even in this context is highly uh, negative. Um, then uh, we have the issues with um, scripts in other languages. So for example, diacrits, if you just add a little bit of noise such as uh, here, the, the, the uh, translation of this sentence, which is written in Arabic, is uh, going from, I'm Canadian, I'm the youngest of seven kids, to I'm Canadian, I'm the youngest of my seven sisters, to something uh, really, really different. We grew up as teacher and we gave me a hug, which <laughs> makes no sense. Um, so it can result in a very catastrophic translation uh, failures. And uh, we didn't really talk about this yet, but today our models can handle both natural language and programming languages. And uh, that's kind of expected for models to be able to do that. And then uh, researchers had noticed that, okay, if we have, um, if we use our standard tokenizer, like the one we are gonna talk about today, uh, then, um, 
or we will have all this white space uh, in front of our um, lines of code, and those are gonna throw uh, throw off the uh, model completely. So what people do today, basically writing rules into their additional rules into their tokenizers is defining uh, additional like blocks of white spaces. And once we define a block of let's say eight white spaces to be like a single token, then your model that is working with Python code starts to work way better. So there are basically the reason why the model didn't work here was just because there wasn't a token in the vocabulary and for purposes of tokenization that had uh, chunks of uh, white space. This is a list for um, Adre Karpati, who has recently made uh, one of the videos on the uh, tokenizer. And here he says also much of what I'm saying right now, that this weirdness of LLMs comes from tokenization issues, which I'm going to read out loud. If you have noticed that uh, LLMs can't spell words, like they can do so many things, but if you ask it to spell a word, it can't do, it comes from tokenization. You notice that LLMs do um, can't do super simple string processing tasks like reversing a string, again, a tokenization issue. LLM is worse to, uh, in non-English languages, tokenization issue. LLM is bad at simple arithmetic, tokenization issues. GPT has had uh, more than necessary trouble coding in Python, tokenization <laughs> issue, which I just uh, mentioned. LLM abruptly halt when, uh, when it sees the string end of uh, text with these extra uh, symbols. Uh, I get the weird warning about uh, trailing white space. LLM break if I ask it about solid gold, muggy carp. It prefers to use YAML over JSON. Um, it's not actually end-to-end -end language modeling and is the real root of, uh, I would say, all suffering, uh, maybe too much. Okay, so like a lot of issues that have uh, are happening in uh, LLM world come from tokenization. So it's a really important uh, topic. There is way more to talk about it than I have dedicated time in this course. Uh, today, we will spend the whole lecture on tokenization. Um, I will first come to this back questions of which units are we going to be using for our modern tokenizers, where characters by something in between. Uh, we are then going to see one uh, one algorithm for tokenization called BPE tokenizer. It's not perfect. It has many issues. Many issues that are on this list come from BPE tokenizer because. GPT family of models uses BP tokenizer, including GPT-4 that powers and GPT-4.0 that power ChatGPT. So it's not, you know, perfect, but this is the uh, one uh, commonly used tokenizer uh, you will see with large language models. And I want you to know about it, know its details, and then hopefully you can fix many of these uh, issues later after this course. And I will just finish with three slides with a few uh, additional notes. Okay, any questions so far? All right. So again, tokenization, splitting a string into sequence of tokens, basic units which need not to be decomposed further. Um, I wanna motivate this discussion about what are these units going to be by asking you this question? So last time we have seen one feature representation, uh, unigram uh, bag of words, bag of words, yeah. Where basically we have vector of the dimension of our vocabulary. Each dimension corresponds to a token um, in the vocabulary with that index. And my question is, what if uh, we, at the test time, I give you a sentence with the word that did not appear uh, in sentences in the training data. Therefore, we did not include it in our vocabulary, right? So what do we do with this? There isn't a dimension in our feature vector that corresponds to that, uh, to that word. How could you maybe go back to your vocabulary? How could you change the vocabulary uh, to handle these words? Or what would you do? 
Yes. Everything is default way to search a thing is default. Very good. Yes. Um, I think the issue might be with that is because other weights are learned co-jointly, right? So is this now new weight you are adding? Is it throwing the, you know, the the vector calculus? I don't know. I would be a little bit cautious uh, with that, but definitely an idea to, to try. Um, something you started with is kind of where I'm getting at. You are kind of saying, okay, we are going to treat all of these equally. So maybe another way to achieve that. Yes. Three tokens that make up the word. Okay, this is kind of where we are getting at later, but what those three tokens are going to be, that's going to be the uh, basically what our new fancy tokenizer will do. But let's stick with the fancy, you know, the simple word. To we have word uh, tokenizer, we just have white space tokenizer. We have put in our vocabulary just the words. And now you have a new word. You can't compose words usually by with other other words. So what to do in that case? Like something simple I'm looking. We could always ignore it, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not what I'm heading at here. Maybe you could uh Make it equivalent to a similar word. To a similar word. Very good. I think for binding synonyms, you would need also an NLP model, right? So now that gets tricky. We are kind of uh, moving in circles. Yeah. Because average of the weights. Um, so um, dictionary itself doesn't have weights, just to just to be uh, clear on that. But if you take the weight vector and use the average weight, and then uh, again, uh, similar with this uh, uh, example, then um, I'm not sure computationally whether the vector calculus, when we do feature times vector product, whether something with other feature, other weights we have learned will now be thrown over by this new feature we have introduced. Again, I don't know, Is you know, we, this is experiment to, to try. You have one token that just covers all the Yes, and this is what commonly has been done uh, before we started to use different tokenizer. Introduction of a so-called UNC token, or which stands for unknown. So historically, we would add in our vocabulary a special token called UNC, U-N-K, and it would have its own index, for example, either first or the last uh, uh, last in the vocabulary. And then every time you see unknown word, you just take the index of that uh, unknown token. Again, I don't know whether all the ideas we have covered uh, are worse than introducing unknown code token, but this is what historically has uh, been. Uh, has been used, excuse me. The issue with the un unknown tokens now, um, what are your thoughts? What do you, what are the, some issues you can think of? Or, um, okay, it's a one way to do this, but what, what are you unhappy about with this solution? Mm -hmm. I think it's probable that it depends on that token, that it puts a more complicated words. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good uh, point. So language has a lot of long tail words. So there is a chunk of very common words and then a massive long tail of other words. Um, and you are right, most likely those words are actually special and they are what you, you know, what made this string distinctive. So you want to remember them. So. We are throwing out information uh, is uh, definitely one one thing that's gonna happen if we use unknown tokens. Any other thoughts? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying if we had two sequences with unknown words, uh, and now these unknown words are completely different, maybe even antonyms across, uh, across these two sentences, 
we translate them all to unknown, and when we lose information that these are completely uh, different ones. Yeah, again, just a loss of information. And I would say many maybe of things that come to mind can be described, but with, like we're just drawing out information. Can we do better than just that? And you kind of hinted on where we are going at, like language is highly compositional. So even words could be split in a smaller chunks. And maybe we know information about smaller chunks if we have different units and then we can combine them. Yeah. If we are including on one topic, aside from just losing information, maybe including ways perhaps? Um, can you give me an example to illustrate that? Um, well, in my mind, it makes it, it kind of uh, seems similar to just adding a random third weight. Like, mm -hmm. okay, forgot the unknown token, forgot the bias term. Like, mm. is an unknown token just kind of like adding another bias term, kind of? Yeah, I can see I can see that. I wouldn't maybe describe it uh, as a noise because the model has seen it during the uh, training and it has even associated weight with it. Yeah. So I think the model doesn't see it necessarily as noise or just like that piece of information that I deal in this way. But you are right that now it's just yet another thing that, you know, it's like, what's the actual point of that? It's it's uh, hard to, to motivate. Um, one thing I put here as a, as a first thing, if you are doing text generation, oh boy, imagine trying generating unks when you use ChatGPT or another tool. Well, that will hardly be a useful model, right? So for some applications such as text generation, it's not even an option, right? Um, and then we have mentioned this, we are losing information. These unknown tokens might be useful anchors of meaning and we are just getting uh, rid of that information. Other languages than English, uh, for example, my native English is Croatian. We have nine, uh, seven cases, we have like inflect word a lot. So for one, you know, uh, root word, we have many, many words that just add suffixes to that word. And some of the word forms might have been seen a lot during the training, but some might have never been seen. And now uh, that just replacing all of these word forms with unknown is not gonna be effective solutions with languages that have more productive, what's called morphology, when we change words a lot to um, give an information about different grammatical goals they play. Uh, in that language. So for many non-English languages, this is not feasible. Uh, I will just give you two more definitions so you are aware of them. Out of vocabulary, OOV, very often in NLP papers, you will just see OOV. They will, they, the authors won't even spell what that means. Uh, these are words that are seen very rarely during training or not even uh, at all. So these rare words, you can also describe them as OOV words. And closed vocabulary models that are, um, these are models like all modern NLP models, not like neural networks. We assume our vocabulary is fixed. So we are not dynamically changing it. Uh, so for example, if you are doing text generation, we are unable to produce word forms and seeing in training uh, data. Okay, so this is still uh, very much so about uh, in the context of the uh, word tokenizers or white space tokenizer. We have also, I believe last week mentioned, well, okay, if working with words is so annoying, why not just go straight into characters, which is the maximal decomposition, right? Like um, you don't need to decompose characters further. Uh, so for example, in uh, Chinese, this might be actually a way better solution than uh, white space tokenizer. Um, it's what counts as a word in Chinese is quite complex. I took a screenshot from Jurovsky and Martin here to give you these examples, which I myself can't write uh, because I don't write or speak Chinese. Uh, so here we have one sentence, Yao Ming uh, reaches the finals. And uh, here these authors point out that this could be treated as three words or as uh, five words, depending on which uh, segmentation firm formalism we think. 
And uh, it is also possible in Chinese to ignore words altogether and use characters as the basic elements, treating this sentence as a series of seven characters. And empirically, people who are working uh, on NLP technology for Chinese language uh, have determined that actually working for characters works better than with words. So, okay, now we have English, word level, kind of working, having some issues. And now we have Chinese where character level, the composition, tokenization uh, is much better. But um, as we're gonna see, we want to, with large language models, produce models that can handle many languages uh, simultaneously. So what's the issue, can you think of, and this is maybe a tricky question, but I'm interested to see whether anyone uh, uh, gets it. What, what is the issue with um, decomposing English into characters? Uh, and to kind of bring you closer where the answer is, um, what does the model then needs to learn in English if we start with the character tokenization uh, in English? Yes. Is it that some letters of nouns can mean different things now or before and after, like you? Uh huh. So uh, pronunciation. Um. Yeah, I don't think you know the model still. Um, if we consider the word order, and we did not still introduce models that do that, but there are models that consider the word uh, the word or character order, then I would say it's not an issue, right? Because you will still see what comes after these uh, characters. Exactly. So now we're kind of making our models work way harder, right? Like in like concept of a word is still important in English. So if we start with a character, your model needs to first learn how the actual letters are comp being composed into into words, uh, and then only you know move forward with uh, everything uh, else that's necessary for deeper understanding of a sentence where these words appear. So it's not it's not great. Like if we want to have one model that handles like Chinese and English, like large language models do, then just sticking with either character level or word level is not uh, sufficient. Okay, maybe you say, well, Anna, why don't we just go to linguists and ask them what is proper unit here, right? Which is a completely reasonable uh, suggestion. Uh, and just to maybe bring another motivation for why these units are gonna be important later on as well. For example, especially if we uh, think about approaches which we'll cover in the last three weeks of the course when we talk about linguistic structure prediction, then uh, very often you tokenize text and your annotators label individual tokens. So what are they labeling also matters. Working with Word, it's quite useful, but maybe working with smaller pieces would be even better for these annotators. Then I said, uh, with white space tokenizer, we have quite a large number of phenomena and to handle. And this is the issue with predefining what the unit is gonna be. It's really hard to identify and to consistently define linguistic units that will then you know, use to tokenize our text in where we will handle all sorts of phenomena we care about. Um, and as I, as I mentioned with uh, white space tokenizers, typographic units, such as those uh, separated by white space have been commonly used as an approximation. And, but then again, white space, as we have seen also is not a typographic separator that's now universe, universally uh, used with a Latin script. So the trying to do this for first principles is going to be hard. So we'll see that we actually won't do that. Instead, uh, because of scientific results that have shown that uh, we should be working with something that's not a word, but not a character either. So something in between like a subword, um, 
then we can have boost in the performance. So in 2016, the BPE tokenizer had been proposed that we'll see that splits to, uh, our sentences in a list of tokens that are themselves the subword units. And then the big boosts in performance happen. There are also technical requirements. Uh, we want to have a fixed size vocabulary for neural language models. And we also want to have a reasonable vocabulary size. So um, with words, for example, you can have many, many words in English language, making your vocabulary quite large. So the notion of a token and tokenization has slightly changed into something quite specific these days. Um, it's now a task of segmenting a sentence in non-typographically and non-linguistically motivated units, which are often smaller than classical tokens, which were with English before uh, words. And they are often called subwords because they are somewhere in between characters and words. This bit is important that they are non-linguistically, non-typographically uh, motivated. And actually they're gonna be learned automatically from data. So we will not define them, rather the BP, uh, the, for example, the BPE tokenizer that we, are just gonna, uh, that we are gonna learn about is going to get the corpus collection of data and then learn what these units are. Um, Still, the notion of word is important even for these uh, tokenizers. So very often uh, today, uh, people are going to first split their um, text into words and then take these words and split them into subwords. And now word tokenizer is commonly referred to as pre-tokenizer and the tokens you get as uh, pre-tokens. Um, in this course, we are going to bring up the Hugging Face ecosystem a lot. Hugging Face is a company that had developed many libraries which are essential for open source development in machine learning, that is deep learning in from NLP, vision, and audio. So here you can see how their library tokenizers had also a uh, definition of pre-tokenizer. Uh, so it's really a term that's uh, used when we call these things. And importantly, now our unseen words, we don't really have them anymore because every word will be some composition of our subwords. So for example, lower uh, uh, might be uh, composed by taking tokens low and er. Okay, and before we go into the actual algorithm, uh, I just want to bring some related terminology, which is uh, important uh, to, to know. Uh, morpheme is the smallest meaning bearing unit of a language. For example, unlikeliest has the morphemes unlikely and EST. Um, morphology study of the way words are built from morphemes. Word forms are the variation of a word that express different grammatical categories. So for example, you can change a word to express tense when something happened, for example, very common way in English is to add the suffix ed uh, to uh, a verb if the uh, if that's how it's formed for that verb. Uh, then something that is not really the case in English because English has largely lost its inflection uh, inflected case system. Um, but in other languages, for example, I mentioned creation with seven cases, we inflect nouns and pronouns to uh, express a grammatical relationship uh, of a given word with other words uh, in, a, in a sentence. So basically uh, syntax of the sentence is um, determined by changing these word forms. Then we have numbers, whether something is singular or plural, we know we add S uh, to the end of a word uh, in uh, to end of a noun in English. And then uh, words can have gender, not extensively used in English just for uh, pronouns, but again, in a, let's say Croatian, every word has uh, a gender. So for example, laptop is a masculine, cup uh, is a feminine. Doesn't make any sense, but it is, it is the case. And then depending on what the gender of a word is, you again change it word form. Okay. Uh, so word forms, as I said, help us convey the specific meaning and function of the word uh, in, a, in a sentence. 
And uh, again, morphology studies how these uh, words are formed. So when I say, okay, this uh, language is morphologically rich, what that means is, okay, these uh, words in the in, in this language, you know, can be, you know, formed, inflected, changed a lot to express these uh, grammatical uh, relationships and specific meanings. Now, I said we are going to learn subwords from data, uh, but and sometimes they will be meaning bearing. You know, you will see very often lots of words where a lot of common words will end up in our vocabulary. Um, but they can sometimes be um, something completely weird, you know, uh, something that has no, it's it's not a morpheme, like it hasn't have any any uh, meaning uh, in the language. So our subwords will be anything, uh, basically. Okay, so just to recap, uh, I have said that for our purposes, neither the character level tokenization and neither word level tokenization is what we want. And we want something in between. We want these subwords, which are, you know, slightly larger units and sometimes even words and sometimes characters too. Um, but they do not necessarily need to have linguistic meaning and they will be learned from the data. Yeah. So even if you have subwords from the time, yeah, so uh, whenever we are doing tokenization, we are doing it in order. So it's not a bag. So it's not, it's a, it's a list. It's an order list. So you're not scrambling. It's not a set, right? So it's a list. Um, so you kind of know what, how, how, like which suburb belongs to which word. You can, you, I'm pretty sure almost with all tokenizers, retrieve that uh, information. So that's not lost. No. Okay, so let's now see our BPE algorithm. Again, um, Idea is to use the data to automatically find what the tokens should be, what our vocabulary is going to be. And the BP algorithm was actually uh, introduced in 1994 as a compression algorithm unrelated to any text data. So it was just a compression algorithm that was then uh, by Senri et al. in 2016 used for purposes of tokenization in the context of applications in machine translation, where it result in big improvements because now the unknown words were not needed anymore. And we handled, we didn't lose that information which we previously were losing by having unknown uh, tokens. Um, and for a more history, you can read this paper by Galais, uh, which, uh, which brings, uh, you know, brings you, gives you more richer history of uh, BPE. Okay, so the BPE is gonna uh, have two stages. One is token learner, where given a raw corpus of text, we are going to learn vocabulary, which are gonna be a set of tokens, uh, like we had words uh, before. And then once we are done with that, we uh, also, it also can be used to do token uh, segmentation where you take the raw sentence and you produce tokens uh, in the vocabulary. Yeah. Corpus, okay. My bad, I should have uh, defined that uh, previously. Corpus is used to uh, denote a collection of text without labels. So just um, all Wikipedia articles, so all, all movie reviews on IMDb. So usually uh, just the pragmatics of how we use corpus and how we use data set, corpus, usually mean it's just a collection of data points that have no labels. Data set um, is commonly used to denote a labeled data set. So, you know, collection that someone had additionally uh, annotated. Yeah. So Wikitext is one common corpus that these uh, tokenizers are trained on and it's just a collection of all Wikipedia articles from some dump, some year. Um, 
also in terms of, I will also write that here too. Where was that? Okay. Yeah, that's a that's an important term. I will add the definition later. Uh, I also didn't uh, introduce this term, uh, which is types. So in our vocabulary, we have every one of the tokens appears only once. And then sometimes people will say those are types to say there is only one of them. And then the occurrence of types in a corpus or a data set are tokens. It's a, just a small distinction to say types occur like once in a vocabulary, tokens are just copies of that type in text. Okay, so uh, we have these two stages and first we are going to see how to learn these tokens. Uh, I will first give you a high level walkthrough through the algorithms and then we are gonna see, work it out on an actual uh, example. So we start with a road train, uh, train corpus and we wanna produce vocabulary. We are gonna pre-tokenize the corpus in words using one of the uh, word tokenizers. There are, I did not cover this, but there are better word tokenizers than white space tokenizers. So actual word tokenizers that are gonna you know, handle punctuation, the least we want from a word tokenizer. And uh, so once we, we tokenize text into pre-tokenize into words, we are going to end a special uh, symbol denoting the end of the word to each word. After that, uh, we are going to uh, initialize vocabulary with a set of all individual characters that appeared in this collection of words. And then we're going to choose two tokens uh, that are most frequently adjacent. Now, have in mind because we had, um, now we have our initial vocabulary that we are going to extend. So when I say here, choose two tokens that are most frequently adjacent, uh, that means from our vocabulary. So let's say those were A and B. Uh, we are also going to respect word, word boundaries. So whatever comes next will be run at the individual word level. We are going to merge symbol, um, merge, uh, excuse me, merge these two tokens, A and B, and add a new merge symbol to the vocabulary, which is gonna be A and B together without white space. And then we're going to change the occurrence of the two selected tokens with a new newly merged token in the corpus. So wherever we see A comma B, we are going to replace it by just one symbol AB. And we are going to continue doing this until there are K merges. So basically we are looking for which symbols appear often together and we are uh, merging them uh, together. Now, all K new symbol and initial characters are the final vocabulary, final vocabulary which means uh, that depending on how many merges we set to have, that's almost how many plus the uh, original characters, that's how many uh, tokens we are gonna have in our vocabulary. And of course, you might ask me then, what's the K? What's the this vocabulary size we want? And I can't give you an answer because that's an actual open research question. There are some you know, orders that people are using right now, like 30,000, it was very common. But then if I see 100,000, I'm not like shocked, you know, like it's still reasonable. reasonable. Um, we'll see later when we start looking into transformer language models that um, this uh, K, how many merges we have and then how big of our vocabulary is, is going to uh, introduce the complexity in our model. We will have a matrix whose number of columns is the size of the vocabulary. And now if the size of the vocabulary is massive, the width of that matrix is massive too. And then you have issues like, how do I feed this matrix onto my GPU compute? If it's this massive matrix, it needs a lot of, lot of memory that causes issues downstream. So you can't just be like, whatever, I'll just introduce as many as I can and cover all my bases because that will make your models less efficient uh, after, um, uh, when, when you start building them. 
So here you need to be uh, careful. Okay, so now when I show it like this, maybe it's too confusing. Uh, so let's let's walk through this algorithm with an example. So here we have a silly little corpus, uh, again, collection of texts here. Uh, these texts are just uh, uh, words like low, lowest, newer, wider, new. This tells you how many times this each one of these words appeared in this silly corpus. And as I said before, you are going to end each one of the, them with this end of word uh, symbol. And you are going to start by splitting them all into characters. So uh, here, each one of them are just the characters. And then you are going to compose a new vocabulary by taking all characters that had appeared in your corpus, which are these. These are the characters that we have seen in the corpus. Questions so far? Okay. So the first, basically we are doing this sequence of operation. What's here in a light gray, we kind of repeat that K times. So first we count uh, all pairs of adjacent uh, symbols. And we can see that here in this example, if you have actually do this and count all, all you know, uh, 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 how many, times uh, pairs of adjacent symbols occur, you would find that the pair E, R occurs the most with a total of uh, nine times. So what the BPA algorithm tells you is that you merge E and R, add it to your vocabulary and change all occurrences of E, R with this new symbol E, R, where you know there is no comma uh, between them, or whatever uh, space, however you want to think about it as to, to separate the items, now you will have just a, a single symbol. So just to repeat here, newer is a, uh, is, is a list of characters, N-E-W-E-R underscore. When we do this, now it has basically one, its, it's uh, length is uh, lowered by one. It's now N-E-W, then here ER together and then underscore. Okay, and now we repeat this K time. We again, uh, in our current, uh, this collection uh, in, in this version of the corpus, we check which two uh, symbols occur most frequently uh, together. And if we do that, we would find out that ER underscore occurs the most. So, what we do next is treat ER underscore as one symbol, add it to our vocabulary, and change all occurrences in our, uh, you know, uh, currently tokenized list of each one of these words, uh, such that ER underscore becomes one symbol in place of two. So here, ER and underscore were separated. Now they're replaced by just a single symbol. Again, count which pairs occurs most frequently, merge them and E here, and then change occurrences of separate N and E into a single N E merge and add N E into the vocabulary. Yes, please. So we mark the end of the word specifically so they can get into something. Why do we not mark the front of the word in some place? Yes, so um, I think uh, there is a lot of variation how people are marking the end of or beginning of the word boundaries. And I think this is, I, I followed Jarofsky and Martin for this illustration. I believe this is then probably how originally in 2016, the uh, BP tokenizer was um, introduced and how the boundaries were uh, covered. But you will see with, for example, um, another software tokenizer word piece that the, uh, there is actually like two hashtags at the beginning of these subwords, uh, which are not the beginning of the word and so on. Uh, I, will, I will give references to different implementations and one of them implement, it's from OpenAI, for example. So you can see how the uh, ChatGPT family of model handles a lot of this. Um, actually, there are a lot of rules on top of these things these days. So. Uh, again, I don't give you the best final version of the BPE, and 
there is a lot of variation, I would say, how people exactly um, mark the beginning or the end of the works. And this is just uh, one of them. I plan, I don't know whether we'll have time, I plan to show some of the implementation and I literally ignore the underscore uh, to demo how to do it in Python. So yeah, um, everyone, whatever, you know, implementation of the BPE you end up using, take a special care with how these things are handled like underscore because it might be different in the actual implementation. But yeah, here it's just, we are marking the end of the uh, end of the word uh, for the purposes you mentioned. And it's one way to do it. Okay, if we had repeated this um, few more times uh, and then said, okay, this is as many merges as we want, uh, this is the final vocabulary uh, that you would get. And as you can see here, you have things like uh, ER, which is a common suffix, right? Uh, in, in these uh, collection of documents and in general. And then you have things like low. So now if you didn't have lower in your vocabulary, which we do not have, it's okay because you can still represent lower. Uh, you can still... Um, split the word lower into low and er. So if we had a sentence that starts with lower uh, in our test instances, and we want to tokenize it, we wouldn't have lower, but we would have low and then er and then other tokens in our list. Yeah. So is the idea of this that they're sorted so that the longest ones are first, it's like a thread? Like newer, you can count new or anti-first. Yeah, I, I think it really depends on what's in your data, right? Like, um, I think whatever is most common will end up being first uh, merged. So, um, I, I'm not sure that the yes, most maybe words themselves might appear uh, as first merges, but it's all determined for the from the data, basically. Yeah, yeah. Some adjacent samples that appear to be the same frequency amount, of, like let's say mm. um, sets that like appear identically, and then I guess an additional question: what if those sets like intersect each other, like and all of those other Okay, let's uh, let's handle the first question. So, what if we have basically times? What if here here I say count all pairs of adjacent symbols and take the most frequent one? What if two pairs are equally frequent. And basically what people decide to do is just pick one randomly. So it doesn't really uh, matter, uh, or at least people claim it doesn't really matter. So that's some one thing uh, you can do. Now, um, can you repeat your second question? I didn't quite get that. What if there's like intersections between uh -huh. the For example, when I looked up on the screen and I saw like L, O, and O, W, you could both consider like frequent pairs but they both intersect each other by each other. Um, okay, so here you would need, you you have LO, and what is the other one? OW. OW, okay, so it doesn't matter that there is one that inters, you know, that's shared in these two pairs. You just check all the pairs, and actually it's always be, gonna be the case that one letter is a pair of the, you know, the one that comes before it and the pair with the letter that comes after it. So that that's not an issue. Yeah. Yes. So in the vocabulary, there's a thing that the end of what is as a new underscore. So that should be in the in the partnership because there's a comment that's um sorry, are you talking a low underscore this one? Okay. So should be not part. Um yes, so here. Yeah, so in the next step. And then the wrong one. Sorry, I don't can you can you walk me through that again? So we have a, a token low underscore and your question is so in this case and it's Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. so here, uh, I don't think we can quite go back to this slide because all of this has happened in the meantime. So I don't know what's the state of our corpus once, you know, at, before we actually added low underscore into our, so yeah. But every time you add new symbol, you are replacing um, 
a pair that made that symbol in your corpus with that merged symbol. Yeah. I feel like it's a little bit maybe hard to visualize because of what I'm saying out loud, it's the exact same thing. It's just, uh, I think maybe the better visualization would be here if we had the list of, you know, uh, a list L comma O comma W comma underscore, and then would be easier to imagine what it happens if I say merge, let's say L and O, then the list would be L O comma W comma underscore end of the list. Okay, so this is basically it. It's kind of repetitive. We are just doing these uh, merging uh, operations. And once we have determined it's enough, we have our vocabulary. And now, of course, um, we need, like, that, that's our, you know, vocabulary, but how do we actually tokenize into the tokens into in the vocabulary? And basically what we do is we are going to uh, use this we are we are recording the merges. So here, these merges are recorded, and when we get our new uh, text, we are just going to apply the merges in order we have introduced them. So imagine here, uh, this is this was not the first merge, but if N E W was first merge, what this means, you will first look for is there um, in your uh, you, in a in a list of characters that make your text that you want to tokenize in new tokens, is there a pair of N E comma W? And then if there is, you're going to merge them because you are using this rule. So again, when, once we are, just a moment, once we are done with making our vocabulary, the way we tokenize the uh, given sentence into the tokens in our vocabulary is by applying merging rules in the order we have recorded them. So the first merging rule we have recorded is going to be the first merging rule we are gonna apply to our sentence that we split into characters initially. So for example, uh, we will, as I said, we will segment each test sentence into characters, then apply first uh, merge rule. For example, if we had E comma R in our list of characters representing text we want to tokenize, then we are going to uh, replace this pair with the merge symbol ER. And we are going to do this as long as we have rules, merging rules in our collection of merged rules. Okay, does this make sense? Okay, so let's look how, what time is it? And we have great more time to look into uh, some code. Okay, so I prepared this, um, this notebook um, using the, let me make this bigger. Is the size of this okay for you all? Yes, great. I like to see thumbs up from the back rows. Um, so basically, here are some resources I have uh, I use uh, to make this. And I just wanna walk you through the Python implementation of this, uh, basically following uh, Andre Karpati's uh, video and his own uh, collab, except that he worked with integers because we, in the lecture we worked with uh, actual tokens uh, representing words and characters. I stuck, um, uh, I, yeah, I, I kept it with characters and words to not confuse you. Um, he used integers for simplicity. So here I copied a text about BPE algorithm from Wikipedia. And I'm gonna first, as I said, make a list of uh, characters just by doing list text, which is the way you can split any string in Python into list of uh, characters. Um, and now let's see how we can uh, implement our token learner, right? Like that was that basically we were repeating those uh, three operations, which K times, K being the number of merges and the operations we were repeating is find the most uh, adjacent pair in the current list and merge them uh, together. So this is the current tokenization of our input. It's just a list of characters. 
In this function, you can, uh, this function implements for every pair of consecutive elements, you find uh, its uh, number, number of time um, it occurs. So here you have tokens and tokens, but starting from not the first, but the second uh, element in your list. This is, uh, if you take zip of these two uh, lists, then you will get a pantronic way to iterate consecutive elements. So this will just give you uh, B, I, I, T, T, E, E, white space, and so on. Um, all right, and every time you see one of these pair, you are going to increase their count by uh, one. And this is just to uh, start with zeros. So this is what this function does. It counts how many times consecutive elements emerge in your um, list of tokens. Um, here, um, I just, um, I don't know why Andre didn't do it, but here I'm just making a lookup uh, dictionary for our uh, initial set of characters. So basically all characters that appeared in our text, I am going to index them and put them in our vocabulary. That's our uh, always going to be initial uh, vocabulary when you use the BPE. So characters are always going to be a uh, part of it, which, you know, is also useful if you have a completely weird word, maybe it's some gibberish, but you have all characters in the alphabet then you can still you know, combine it from the, from the character. So you will never have unknown uh, words. Okay, so here, uh, this function is just going to sort uh, our, um, our uh, pairs of consecutive elements uh, by the time they appear uh, in our list of uh, tokens. So here, basically what you're getting is that E, and then uh, white space occur 28 times in this text, and therefore they are our most uh, frequent uh, pair of two consecutive uh, items, which are initially characters. Great, uh, top pair you just get from this, uh, basically what appears uh, to uh, be uh, the high, not appears to be, what is the uh, most uh, frequent uh, pair. Um, yeah. If, Notice the stats is not the actually sorted one. If I had defined, uh, give me the function that gives me the most frequent element from the sorted one, I would just take the first element uh, if that confused anyone for a hot second. And then the last thing we need is our function that does merging operation, right? So this is done over here. So you give it the list of tokens, you give it the pair you want to merge, and you give it the symbol you want to merge with. Basically, what this does is iterates over your uh, list of tokens, which are in the first iteration going to be a list of characters, right? And then um, unless you see that there is a pair you are looking for, meaning that uh, at the at the uh, at the current position, you are on the first element of your pair, and the next one is the second element of your pair, and you are not gonna cross over your boundaries of the uh, of of the uh, list you are given. Then you are going to uh, uh, use the new symbol, and here we are creating a completely new list. So. Otherwise, if you haven't encountered your pair, you're just adding what you have in your uh, list. This is the implementation of our merging operation. And for example, here we have lowest, I wanna merge L and O, and I wanna merge it such that occurrence of L comma O is replaced by one symbol, L O. If I do this, then I will get exactly what I expect. L O comma W comma E comma S comma T comma underscore. Okay, so here we can put it all together. Uh, notice, I think this is important. If we have started with the list of uh, characters, then your vocabulary is already um, of the size of the number of characters you have. Um, and then this is actually wrong. This should be, uh, this is a mistake. This should be um, length of the vocab you have right now. And if you have some desired um, desired vocabulary size, 
then the number of merges can be defined through vocab size minus um, the length of your vocabulary. Okay, so I think this is gonna probably be too much. So let me see. And I am I know I'm running out of time, but let me just for a moment put this all together. So while for the number of merges you have set uh, in your you know as a hyperparameter, what you are doing is finding the occurrence of each pair in your current uh, tokenized corpus. Uh, you find a pair which is occurring the most, and you say, I'm going to uh, replace the occurrence of this pair in the list with a single N element, which is the merged uh, symbol of these two uh, elements making this pair. And then you call your merging operation, which makes that new list, right? Uh, where now these are, instead of having them two separate items in a list, now they are just a single item in a list. And you are going to add the merge symbol into your vocabulary. And this basically puts together uh, all the operations we have seen in the PP algorithm. Um, OK, next time, then I will finish talking a little bit more about tokenization, and then we'll switch to neural networks. Thank you.